Welcome back to Dairy Public Radio. Reporting live from the basement of the Dairy Civic Center, this is Joshua Khan with your news. Uh, no news today. So let me tell you a story. <clears throat> I'm sorry, listeners. Stevens, our station manager, has reminded me that there is a time and a place for stories. So, in today's news, you're listening to Dairy Public Radio. This is Dairy Public Radio. Welcome back to Dairy Public Radio, a bi-weekly Stephen King book club podcast. I'm one of your hosts, CM Alexander, alongside Benjamin Graham. Hey there, constant readers. And Joshua Khan. Hey, everybody. And today we are on part four of Different Seasons, The Breathing Method. <sighs> Gross. <laughs> and today we have Josh leading us through the discussion. Yeah, all right, let's, uh, let's get to it, guys. The final and shortest story in Different Seasons. Mm-hmm. I'm... Really excited to talk about this story because it's so weird. Uh, but we're just going to, um, the the quick synopsis, in case you haven't read it, uh, which you should have because this is going to be spoilery otherwise. It's about a man who goes to the club and at the club they tell stories. And on Christmas, the Thursday before Christmas, there's always a very special story. This is about that story, kind of. More or less. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a differing opinion. <laughs> That this is a story about nothing. It's, it's it's a whole bunch of half ideas thrown together into a story. But yeah, that's more or less right. Oh, CM is giving me a look <laughs> that she is very upset with me. <laughs> I'm not upset. I just completely disagree with everything you said. <laughs> oh God, I okay, can't wait. Get, yeah, let's get into All it. All right, well, uh, we'll just jump in right at the top. We meet our. Uh, Half of our protagonists, uh, David Adley, 73-year-old man, hailing a cab in a terrible snowstorm because he needs to get to the club. And for this entire beginning section, uh, he talks about that after this night, he will never see taxis or snowstorms the same way ever again. And so my initial thought was like, oh, th- like something's going to happen to him like that's what this story is about is Mm -hmm. the instance that's uh, going to happen in the cab right now but it's not it isn't at all no it's about effective storytelling (laughs) wow (laughs) that that wasn't directed towards you it was just the story he heard the The story he heard was so impactful that it didn't have to happen to him (laughs) exactly Just the way you said it makes it sound like you're already going to bat for this book so hard. It was my favorite of this. Okay, wow, that's insane. That is bonkers. I have a reason though. Okay, all right, that's absolutely crazy. I can't wait to get into that. (laughs) All right, so uh, let's talk about the club. Uh, He gets to the club and uh, he's greeted by Stevens, and he he notes that there's nothing there's nothing marking. This club, there's just the the address and nothing stands out about this place. There's no name above the door. It just he walks up and as he approaches, Stevens opens the door. The the steps are shoveled and and night neat and clean and he brings them on in and he walks through and he sees a lot of the regulars. Mm -hmm. So what were your guys' first thoughts about the club? The club? Okay, I will give uh, that this isn't a bad story. It's I, I, I did like it. The club was, hands down, the most interesting thing about this story. For sure. Yeah. Um, because it is very mysterious but comforting. It's this old uh, boys club, I imagine, like an old hunting lodge. It's all wide open library. And uh, I can imagine just feeling so cozy the way it's described. But as the story progresses there are hints dropped at the origins of the club. And uh, throughout the book, the main character uh, keeps feeling like he needs to ask questions. He wants to know more about what this club is because the the club, finger quotes, 
doesn't have a name. It's not even technically a club. He never asks or is given membership to it. He's just introduced to it. Yeah. One of the things they say is the the club has no records, no positions, no phones, and no name. Mm-hmm. And it's it's just this place where it seems mostly elderly gentlemen come to uh, socialize and tell these stories. But there's these hints dropped throughout the story that can't become brought to the forefront at the very end. And what drives me insane is why isn't that the whole story? (laughs) I want to know about the club, but the story isn't about the club. It's about stories. So I guess it's trying, it's meta? Is it meta, guys? Am I using that right? I enjoyed being teased in that way, I guess. I did want more of the club. I wanted to know, like, it's clearly, there's more to it than meets the eye. And there's this mystery wrapped up in the club and Stevens, and we don't get to know. We don't get to, you know, you're watching a horror movie, and the whole time it's building the suspense. And the final act, they reveal the monster, and it's always disappointing. I don't want to see the monster. Hmm. It's not as scary that way. And so leaving me with that mystery of what is this club, I want to know more about it. And I think you can infer a lot more about it through King's other work, and which we've talked a little bit about before. I I agree. It's it's definitely heavily alluded to, but it's just the whole story is just a... Couple hundred page long cocktees that, that will never <laughs> get it uh, is. resolved. <laughs> it, Stand by me could have been a little shorter, and this should have been a little longer. Yeah, this, I so, agree with that. This 100%. story is sixty pages. Mm-hmm. It is so brief, but there are so many little things. So it, after we are introduced to the club and we see some of the members, David talks about his first time going to the club because his boss George Waterhouse just comes by his office one day and starts talking to him and casually invites him to the club. And he just says that he that he didn't want to go, but his boss is like, no, you should you should definitely come out. Just come with me. It, it'll be great. Doesn't want to refuse his mm-hmm. boss's invitation, mm-hmm. so he politely goes. And I like that his wife is like, oh, it's just going to be like a parlor and people are going to be playing cards or... Telling war stories. Telling war stories, all this stuff. And he gets there and it is the scale of it is so massive Mm -hmm. and points out that the first day he arrived there, that Stevens looks the exact same now in the present as he did the very first time he was there. Yeah, he says he suspects that he is decades older than he seems. Which is interesting. Very interesting. Tell me more, (laughs) Stephen. Oh, what? No, you won't? Okay. Stevens is such an interesting character, though, because he's always he's like a magic butler. Basically, yeah. like he, sh- he shows up like and like hands you your drinks or it takes your coat. He's always got, you know, your coat ready for you when you go to leave. Mm-hmm. There's that uh, that weird intuitive nature mm-hmm. to what Stevens uh, supplies to the place. Yeah, because there there are some descriptions of Stevens throughout the book that make you think he's maybe a little dangerous or mm-hmm. something other. There, Yeah, there is something that's slightly ominous when whenever he interacts with Stevens. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Ben, you touched on the library. Yes. The, the expansive library and how, like, he finds it and he's so blown away by this huge library. And the thing that initially, uh, like, struck me about it is that he finds these books that are written by an author he's never heard of. But it's this giant series of books and they're published by a publishing company he's never heard of. There are poems written by poets he knows, but he's never heard of these poems mm-hmm. and that was uh that felt really dark towery to me like yes. I was very <laughs> i was very like that was the first instance where I'm like oh god i got something yeah got that's <laughs> that's the thing we've been dancing around yeah. i think yeah yeah it is very clear it, it is never directly tied to the dark tower nope. mm-hmm. but um the themes of the dark tower of alternate worlds and Things from elsewhere 
Yeah, he finds these books. I don't remember the author's name. Oh, uh, it is uh, Edward Gray Seville. Okay, published Edward, by Stedman and Son. Yeah, Edward Gray Seville, and he he lists a, two of the two of the books that he was written, but there's like twelve or thirteen of them, and like he, he throws that out, and he's like, oh, I I've never heard of them, and I like the whole I haven't either. But I wonder, I'm not smart enough to know if this is just like some really rare thing. So <laughs> I immediately Googled Edward Graceville, and the first and only thing that comes up is a Wikipedia page titled List of Fictional Authors from Stephen King Books. <laughs> like Charlie the Choo Choo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Claudia E. Inez. Or, Beryl Evans. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So, like, that's the the first that first inclination that like something is is not right about this place. And as he's making his way around, uh, suddenly he sees this massive fireplace that takes up like a giant chunk of the wall of this main room. And he's people are gathering their chairs around and coming in because it is time for someone to tell a story. So David hears his first story in the club uh, from Norman Stett. And I was so mad because all it is is, oh, he tells a story about a man who drowned in a telephone booth. Exactly. But it's not my place to tell that story exactly. here. Let's move on. And I was like, what that the is fuck? The entire encapsulation <laughs> of this fucking story is, man, I heard a really, really interesting thing. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> so in Stand By Me, we get this, what was that called? Stud, stud City. city. Stud ci- we, stud we get Stud City. We get pages <clears throat> of Stud City. Why couldn't we get <laughs> this? Yeah, but I'm not. I'm not faulting it. I'm. I'm actually uh, faulting the other one. Like, oh, yeah, <laughs> you put that there, but we can have this here. Yeah, <laughs> I was on record at being annoyed at Stud City <laughs> in uh, the Breathing Method. Sure, the story is about the story of the Breathing Method. But it's also kind of about stories in general. And there are so many stories that they're like, oh, yeah, we heard a story. It was pretty cool. Uh, here's one sentence of it. Oh, I, moving on. Uh, it, it drove me insane. And it felt to me like Stephen King, when writing this, was like, okay, guy, I got to do this novella book. Oh, man, I have this amazing idea about a story about a guy that drowns in a phone booth. Oh, man, I got this other amazing idea for, like, a guy who kills someone, but it won't stay dead. Oh, that'd be so cool. Oh, this story about, uh, uh, about Lamaz, question mark. Uh, <laughs> these are all so, oh, I, but I can only put four in it because it's called Different Seasons and they're all, fuck it, I'll just put them all in the same story. <laughs> fuck it. It's all Good. going in there. No, <laughs> no idea left behind. I'm throwing it all in. No segues. No segues. <laughs> He actually wrote each of those after a major story. What? Like he wrote. Each of these I, four I can't stories. remember. Yeah, oh. they were not all written together mm-hmm. or necessarily to be put into one book together. I guess part of his process or part of his winding down. I'm not quite sure. After he writes, you know, something like Carrie or mm. Salem's Lot, he has this short story usually in his head that he just has to get out, huh. and he ended up putting those four into different seasons. Interesting. And the reason that that. he called it different seasons is because this was early on in his career and his uh, publisher kept warning him that you're going to get typed as a horror writer. And so he, you know, had these best-selling books then, of course. So he finally decides to throw his publisher a bone and he's like, these aren't (laughs) horror books. Except for Not the two stories. They, are. they well, they have <laughs> elements mm. in them, but they are not really horror stories. And his publisher is like, "Well, uh, are you sure? No, no <laughs> horror story." So he had even titled it different seasons, like, "Hey, that'll tell readers when they see it." Not a horror story, huh? Well, that's cool. Yeah, that's very neat. David, here is a night of stories we mm-hmm. that that we don't get to hear, and he shares a cab with his boss to go home and the first thing is that they're outside the building and he's like hey that uh you know that story was was really good and his boss is back to being like uh yeah sure and like not not acknowledging anything that happened in the club like it, it very quickly set that 
what happens there Mm -hmm. is there. When we are out here, we don't talk about any of that. He even says that he thinks when his wife asks about it, that he feels like he has to lie or else he'll never see the inside of that place ever again. I thought that was kind of cool. And I thought it was interesting the way he describes himself as an employee of this law firm, which I think was something to the effect of I'm just here. I've been here, you know, doing what I need to do, not really anything more or less kind of plodding along. And then he he has no idea why he was given this opportunity, what what his boss and we never talk about that, what his boss saw in him that he knew he'd be a good fit for the club or what the the referral process would Mm be. Which I thought was interesting that That they kind of left that. Interesting that I did not think about that at all. (laughs) Yeah, the 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 because all of the the members of the club all seem to be high society and men that are uh, at, at the top of their respective fields. There's like a, a respected doctor and mm-hmm. surgeon, a lawyer. It's almost as though being a member of the club, uh, I can imagine all of these members of the club starting as that, mm-hmm. as lower on the totem, and then they are chosen and brought in because later on in the story, he's told after so many, a few years of being a member of the club, he's brought into his boss's office and saying, we're taking you on as a junior partner. I know you're a little too old for that, but we have to do that. If we're going to make you a full partner by the end of the year, how much of that is influence from this club? And is that influence mundane the members of the club just helping out fellow members or is it some other force i would say that it's tied to the club because i think this because you have those moments in the book where he's about to ask stevens a question Mm -hmm. and he gets the sense that he shouldn't that it is not okay to ask and he doesn't and so there are these unspoken rules of the club And perhaps the impression I got was if you can play by those rules, then you are, you belong. Yeah. Yeah. And Josh, what you were saying about when he leaves the club, uh, Waterhouse, right? Yep. Turns his back on him when he says, hey, great story, man. And Waterhouse completely shuns him. Mm -hmm. It ties back to the inscription over the fireplace, this giant fireplace that they all gather around. And before the tale, uh, there's a a packet of powder that is thrown into the fireplace that creates uh, these amazing, brilliant colors in the fire. uh, Some of which he describes as beyond the color spectrum, fleetingly dancing in the fire. And uh, above this fireplace is in the, Uh, center stone the inscription it is not the man it is the tale not he who tells it thank you and so yeah when he goes out and says hey waterhouse great story that's breaking like that Mm -hmm. fundamental tenement of the club yeah of uh it's about the stories who cares who tells them you know almost it doesn't matter what the story is just tell a story and uh then once it's out it's done the person does not matter yeah so now we get to our very first christmas which is the they make a point that the thursday before christmas is the some one person is selected to bring the story for christmas Mm -hmm. and it has to be something uh, uncanny in some way and um peter andrews tells a story about the x-men (laughs) <laughs> what he the story has to be uncanny oh, God damn so it. he tells a lengthy story <laughs> about uh he reads his gambit fanfic. and his best friends the x-men <laughs> he reads the fanfic of carrie versus the dark phoenix <laughs> yes. that we alluded to earlier um and <laughs> this story we don't hear it because we don't hear any stories except for the breathing method Mm. but this story is so gruesome that it gives david nightmares for weeks afterwards and that's all we know about it is that it's that severe but it explains that uh this is the night every member 
quote, member of the club, almost everybody is there for that Thursday before Christmas because that's always the most amazing story. And uh, then we talk about, he talks about the, what we kind of alluded to earlier that the club takes care of its own, like the man who was a member of the club that died, they collected $10,000 to give his wife. Uh, that was donated anonymously and they do all these, these little things and it makes every brings everybody in mm-hmm. closer. So it becomes mm-hmm. like this extra tight knit uh, mini society, which is what keeps everything closed in of rich white men. Yes. Of presumably rich white men. We don't know that for a fact. I have to set that aside to enjoy. The book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so now we are back to the present day. And it is uh, Emlyn McCarran, who is, uh, I believe he says uh, he he has never heard Emlyn tell a story before. This yeah. is the first time he's hearing him tell a story. Mm-hmm. And so he tells the story of the breathing method. Oh, boy. Here we go. <laughs> Which, so we were, uh, you know, a couple pages into this, and now we've completely jumped to another storyteller. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that, that now forget this entire protagonist we've been following this whole time. Now let's focus on on this story. I really liked him, though. It's an uh, excellent I, story. I, I mean, it was a nice. Is it? <laughs> yes. Okay. I, I thought <laughs> it was told you got well. It. I thought I <laughs> thought it. Yeah. It drug me in. So, what did you think about it, Josh? Um, I was so bored <laughs> <laughs> until the last six pages. Okay. Uh, something. One of the things that I, I wrote in my notes was that this is a sixty-page story of which I was bored for fifty of it, uh, devoured six, and then okay with four. <laughs> <laughs> I did the math. I really did the math on this one, guys. Uh, it was, it was long. <laughs> About, um, you know, the, this doctor who a woman comes in and she is pregnant and. He is going to take care of her. This woman is pregnant out of wedlock. Pregnant out of wedlock. Yeah, this is back when you could not do that. And in fact, she lost her job and her apartment Mm -hmm. because of that and was treated very shittily. Yes, she was. Yeah. When did the story take place? Because the story, the story that, okay, how do I parse this information? The main story. Yeah. The story of the club members takes place in the 70s. 70s? Yeah. And this one's in like the The 40s. It was after the war. It was after World War One. Oh, so late. Oh, yeah, that's right. It was World War One. Yeah. So like 30s, probably. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. Doesn't matter. Anyway, there's a huge chunk of time where women don't have rights. So I mean, just (laughs) yeah, (laughs) this is this is true. Uh, But he, uh, so the doctor, uh, he has always had an interest in uh, obstetrics. And he mentions that he went and he opened a general practice because to have a career in that specialty, usually you have to start earlier. And he was busy being a medic in the war and just realized he wouldn't have the time. Uh, But so he opened his general practice with just a a, a focus on that. Like he wanted to help mothers deliver new children because childbirth is one disgusting (laughs) two dangerous. And he wants to do it in such a progressive way way for his Mm -hmm. time i loved that i think that's why i liked him so much and i liked their relationship too because of how he describes her when he first meets her and Mm -hmm. that that line where they stop him in the middle of his story and they're like did you love her Mm -hmm. i I love that i liked that moment a lot um i i loved okay the more i think about it the more i actually did like the framing device Mm -hmm. of it's this uh one person telling the story uh, to a group of people because it feels that way. It feels almost like you are there in the parlor having the story yeah, told. Because yeah. the members interrupt him with the same things I wanted to interrupt yes, him yes. with. I didn't even think of that. <laughs> yeah. It was like, yeah, I had that question too. Good job. And his answer, his answer is awesome. It really, yeah. That, I was really glad that the answer is not that he was in love with her, just that he just respected her mm-hmm. so much and that she, he just felt the the force of nature that she was yeah. and uh, just admired it so much that he was so willing to help and be there. And he could have, there's a moment he could have fallen in love with her, but the circumstances just didn't line up. And that was okay. 
Mm. He didn't have to be in love with her. That was beautiful and tragic. Yeah. <laughs> it's always such a great moment that those missed, missed true loves maybe. Yeah. And that you never know, but that their relationship was so important to him that he's okay with that. He's okay with the relationship that he had. Mm-hmm. Uh, so she has the test, comes back. He says, you're pregnant. She's like, duh. <laughs> uh, and then asks if he will treat her because she's unwed and uh, has no plans to do anything about that. Uh, but she has plans to have this kid. Mm-hmm. Like it's she's determined and he can tell that she's determined. And she pays her bill when she leaves her. She her pays entire it in full. Bill. Yeah, it's because she says that she given the circumstances and what people are likely going to and end up doing to her, she might not have that money later and she wants uh-huh. to put the baby first because the baby should come first. She is hands down my favorite character in the story. Uh, yeah. Mrs. I'm going to do it again, guys. Mrs. Ms. Stetfield. Stanfield. Stansfield. Oh, I was so, <laughs> you were so close. close. Uh, Sandra Stansfield. Sandra Stansfield <laughs> is a fantastic character. She is at only 23. Uh, yeah. She Did we is. ever actually get her actual age well he he says that she says she's 28 on the paper Mm. and during his examination he's like there's no way she's older than 23 so she could be younger than 28 Uh, i believe uh, 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 because her vagina It was a 23-year-old vagina, not a 28-year-old vagina. CM, of the three people in this room, you should be the one that knows you can't just count the rings. I do know that. That's what I'm struggling with. How does he know she's... Oh, my God. Uh, Moving on. Anyway, yeah. She's a super strong character. She's strong-willed. She's She was never intimidated by anything. We've pointed out Life for women, when the story takes place, sucked. And she just fucking kills it. She uh, doesn't give two shits when his <laughs> when his uh, nurse or receptionist or whatever. Mrs. Is like, Davidson. Uh, she's just a chippy. What, what's that? <laughs> uh, she's, she was just a chippy and uh, an unmarried Better. mother. How dare she? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm some kind of gnome. Uh, uh, but when she she pays all of this money up front and gains her respect just yeah. because she's a hard-nosed badass, kind of. She's a badass. She is a badass. Yeah. I, and, but I also, I, the th- another thing that I like about her is that her story is nothing special. Mm. That he talks, like, that over the time he's been seeing her, finds out she just... She came from the Midwest to New York to be an actress. And then she was homesick and lonely and found comfort in a boy in one of her acting classes. They slept together twice. She got pregnant. He said, I'll take care of you. And then didn't. Disappeared. (laughs) And he tells this story immediately after saying, her story was so common, it needn't be told. (laughs) (laughs) I forgot about that. (laughs) (sighs) This this fucking book... (laughs) Tells all the goddamn information we don't fucking need and then keeps everything interesting locked behind closed doors. That's Stephen King sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Jesus. Uh, but then we get to the moment where he explains to her the breathing method, which is Lamaze breathing. Did but that it, remind you guys? Yes. Of the of Heimlich Devin, maneuver? Yes. yes. <laughs> Stephen King's apparent trope of anachronistic uh, medical procedures. <laughs> so we've got to see the birth of the Heimlich yeah. and the and the Lamaz method <laughs> by people who I, it's not named after. <laughs> I hope one day he reads a book about how Christ gives someone an appendectomy. <laughs> that would be oh my God. a real awesome book. Oh, uh, yep. Something that I had never uh, considered because I'm uh, never going to physically birth a human uh, mm-hmm. is that you and poop? again, like, is it that you poop? I know that you poop. Okay, you poop. Yeah, you do poop. That's the least horrifying it's thing. It's disgusting. <laughs> the 
when he goes into like, you should do this because if you go into in this time period, if you were to go into a maternity ward there, people are just screaming like people, it's like they're being murdered and all of that wasted energy that could be put into actually birthing the baby uh, and that mother's are hyperventilating mm-hmm. and it, it puts everyone at more danger because uh, there's, there's no control. Like yeah. your people, they can't keep calm or they have to pump them full of a bunch of drugs to make it work. And so that's why he is just very adamant about, you know, it, this is, I'm going to tell you this, but if you doubt it, it's not going to work. Cause if you doubt this process, the time's going to come and you're going to give up on it or your friends or someone's going to talk you out of it to say that it's, it's nonsense and and all this. So like, Mm. I, if you want to, I, I'm recommending this practice this and it'll, it'll work. And she's just, yeah. All right. You're my doctor. I I don't give a shit what anybody else says. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to do everything you say. Oh my God, guys. Just something like clicked in my brain. Her steadfastness, her determination, her everything about her. She's female Andy Dufresne. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. And she becomes like this myth. Oh, my God. Wow. My head just blew up. (laughs) Yeah, it didn't occur to me until just now. Because when we get to the end of the story, mm-hmm. it is <laughs> it is Andy Dufresne's steadfastness and determination taken to the yeah. millionth power. Yeah. So uh, we after she's learned about the breathing, uh, she gets fired from her job. Mm-hmm. And she, I love that she's like, eh, I was doing the Lamaz breathing or else I would have smashed everything and be in jail right now. So thank you. Yeah, because her employer, <laughs> uh, a woman, Miss Kelly, I think, yeah. blamed her for her situation. It, it like was accusing her. You didn't tell like she deceived her yeah. for not telling her she was pregnant. And it was at that point, I think she has the idea to buy a wedding ring. And so when she inevitably gets kicked out of her apartment, she can just give this story that her she's a widow i would really like to i i took this from the book um, <laughs> that she bought the wedding ring so that she's not a little round geeps strumpet and her child's not a bastard wait what a little round geeps strumpet that that were you reading on an ebook or something no that's the book is that what it says? yes because i read it as round healed oh is it oh maybe i've because Round heels is not a word. Did you auto auto correct? I did a, apparently that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, round heel strumpet. That makes way more sense. Yeah, but you were so confident <laughs> about it. I thought I nailed it. <laughs> but her kid's still not a bastard, right? Bastard's the yeah, right thing. Yeah. All right, good. You got it. Woo. Yeah, bastard <laughs> is a word, Josh. <laughs> That's why you can't trust anything I say, because I say everything <laughs> with, with that 100% level of confidence. confidence. It yeah. is my wheelhouse. Oh <laughs> That's how I get God. by in life. I I don't have any notes for that. I've just been making up the story, and you guys are like, yeah, that was it. <laughs> this is so <laughs> off the rails. <laughs> I am the Ron okay. Burgundy of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're coming up on her third trimester and it's at this moment that Emlyn has a, a precognitive interlude of Sandra's death that will happen four months later in a senseless accident on her way to deliver which is not how I wanted this to go <laughs> I second that <laughs> Well, yeah, it's interesting because I, I obviously the story had to have some uncanny twist, something out of the ordinary, something extra. What, what's the <laughs> word because, I'm looking because for? Because it's a Christmas yeah, story. Yeah, because so it's a Christmas story. You know it has just so this something whole weird. time I've been thinking, what could it be? Baby's going to be born a devil? Yep. That's, That's what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, like monster baby or something. And this is the first time that it's hinted at what the ending is going to be. So like, 
what exactly were you expecting? Oh, Monster Baby. Monster Baby. Yeah, I, I was, you know, because the story had been, I, I was so bored. Yeah, it was so <laughs> I was so bored waiting for like, mm-hmm. yeah, this is, but I know something has to happen because this wouldn't be a Christmas story otherwise. So just tell me what the fucking thing is. Mm-hmm. I could not have imagined in my wildest dreams the thing it actually ends up being. Nope. So let's get well, to at it. At least not until the dream. <laughs> well, I, I, I just thought the dream was a dream. Okay. You know? Part of it is every other story in this book was so not uncanny mm. that I forgot <laughs> that that's the story that we were going to get with the Christmas tale. Mm. Yeah. She goes into labor. It's Christmas Eve. The weather is icy and windy and terrible. She calls the taxi and then calls him and says, I'm, I'm going into labor. You know, please meet me at the hospital. Uh, you know, I, I can't do this without you is the 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 feeling that she has. Mm-hmm. In fact, she was so worried that he would be out of town on Christmas. Yeah, leading up to that. Yeah. She it's like she had this precognitive sense too that something wasn't going to go right, which makes it all the more tragic. Yeah. I was this is all like where as soon as she goes into labor, that's when I that that six pages that I was locked in, like this is where it happens because mm-hmm. I know that and he, and he kind of jumps around a little erratically like he uh, he says that the traffic was terrible and that the cabbie was super nervous. He knows he was super nervous because he talked to him later and and he talked about that the woman was uh, the way she was breathing made him nervous because she was doing the Lamaz breathing and he was he was expecting her to be screaming. He wished mm-hmm. that she would have just been screaming. Like yeah. All the other women. And that that threw him. So the and now the doctor has shown up. Just he's walking up the stairs and he turns around just in time to see it. The taxi is coming up to the hospital uh, right in front of the the statue of Harriet White because of the Harriet White Memorial Hospital. The ambulance starts to pull out. The cab's going too fast, slams on its brakes. The ambulance brakes fishtails into the statue. The cab spins all the way around the ambulance rebounds off of the statue into the cab, causing the cab to then slam into the statue. My brain could not comprehend that accident where I had to read it like six times. My brain uh, immediately replaced all of that with cars smash up real good. (laughs) Like I was like, I'm not working out the logistics of this. I get it. I had to, I I I had to know. So like I was, Trying to figure it out. And that's why I had to write it down beat for beat so it would it make sense in my head. The point is, it's horrific. Sandra flew out of the rear right side window, out of the cab, into the night. Which is so terrifying. The doctor runs over and unknowingly kicks her severed head on the way to her body. Trips <sighs> over a severed head. And he does not lose his shit. <laughs> well, he was in the war. He was in the war. A like, little bit. He, did, yeah. he does start calling a nurse Sarge. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was, that was which perfect. Which was really good. That yeah. whole, yeah. And so the he gets to the body, and the body is still breathing. Not only is it breathing, it is still using the method. Yeah, it's not like a reflex or a twitch after death. It is... Doing the breathing method. And he, that he he hears not the, the sound you would normally hear of somebody doing it because her windpipe is no longer connected to a mouth. Mm-hmm. So he just hears the spurts of air coming through her windpipe in the, the cadence. And he realizes that at this moment, the baby can be saved. And so he had his, his bag with all of the stuff. He gets down. He's going to deliver this baby. One of the ambulance drivers walks up, sees her, freaks out, and then just walks off into the night. Yeah. I Which, don't know, never to be heard from again. That is the correct <laughs> response. <laughs> like, is that a corpse breathing? Yep, I'm out. Yeah. Later. Uh, the other ambulance driver faints, just sees it and just drops. Then uh, a nurse finally runs in and he's like, can I get you anything? A blanket. And she starts to go back inside. <laughs> And he's like, from the ambulance. It is right here. Yeah, there's a part right there that I found just interesting in Stephen King's style. The 
character telling the story, Emlyn, says to his group, essentially, you know, uh, thank, we have to thank God every day for the women who, because he's also calling her Sarge at this point. And he's like, I, I thank God every day for the women who can keep their heads and not question the strange because they don't need to. Mm-hmm. And then in the story, he immediately calls her a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> At least he didn't call her a silly cunt like <laughs> in the back half. Very true. <laughs> very, very true. Um, so he's, he's got the nurse, the, the breathing starts speeding up and the baby's born. And I love that, that that's the moment that I think we were all on the same page of what was going to happen because the nurse says, what if it's a monster? And so that's when I was like, it's going to have horns, <laughs> like something. It's going to be like, yes, this is fantastical that this body is still giving birth, but like the baby's going to be a monster. Okay. Did anyone else think who is this baby? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I was what I wanted to happen. And, and I'm OK with how it actually happened, which Josh will get to. But what I wanted to happen was for him to raise the child as his own. Yeah. OK. All right. I can see that. OK. Uh, I thought. One of two things. Either, A, it's our main character of the whole story, and that's why he was brought to the club. That that briefly crossed my mind, but But it seems to... Chronologically, I don't... That does not work (laughs) out at all. And B, I was just like, what other Stephen King character could this be? All right, so Baby is Born... Wraps the baby in a blanket. The nurse takes off running inside. He gets up and he starts backing away. And the body is still breathing. But the breathing is slowed. And as he's walking backwards, he kicks something. And it's the goddamn head again. (laughs) He's kicked this lady's head twice. (laughs) He just feels compelled to pick it up. And he picks up the head. And he turns it over. And he sees that the mouth and teeth are still moving. And then the eyes look at him Mm -hmm. and I lost my shit. (laughs) I was like, that is so fucking cool. And that he sees. And just before the eyes turn to look at him, he says that he can see her in her eyes. He can see her determination and he can tell that she was seeing him right now. And that's what it looks. That's Andy Dufresne to the (laughs) million of the determination of I'm not going to get out of this prison. I'm going to I'm going to be so determined. I'm not going to fucking die when my head gets knocked off my goddamn body. Yeah. That's ah, it's so cool. That is so intense. And so creepy. The part of this that really weirded me out was he's he's holding this head. And there's a crowd of people yeah. watching him kneeling holding this severed head which is already just a visual that's Mm -hmm. pretty upsetting. But he says he can see her mouth mouth the words, thank you, Dr. McCarran. Dr. McCarran. And he can hear it. He can't hear the words, but several feet behind him, he can hear the rushes of of, uh, wind or air coming out of her severed throat hole in seven short bursts, oh. the same syllables in of the words that she was saying. And I would have nightmares forever. <laughs> <laughs> no joke. So wrapping up the story, uh, she says, thank you. He says, you're welcome. It's a boy. The light in the eyes goes and she is dead. That I yeah. almost cried during that when she he's holding her head and she, she says, thank you. And just the casualness of you're welcome. Yeah, it's a boy like the 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 kindness of telling her that mm-hmm. I, I I did nearly cry at that <laughs> point. So he uh, he pays for her burial uh, the the child is put up for adoption, and even though at that time like records were pretty much always locked, he he did what he had to do to stay at arm's length from mm-hmm. this child, and uh, said that he you know that he was adopted and he was taken into a good family, and that he's the youngest English prof- uh, head of the English department at a, a very prestigious college, and that he's 
got his mother's determination and her hazel eyes. And that's how he ends his story. And now we have to jump back to our other protagonist <laughs> that I've almost entirely forgotten about at this point yes. because I'd gotten so into this main story. Everyone, everyone goes home and David decides he's going to ask Stevens the hard questions. He's going to ask him about the books. He's going to ask him about how like the brands on the pool table and things don't match. He can't find those anywhere and how everything only seems to exist here. But instead he just asks if there are more rooms upstairs. <laughs> that is, that is it. And then he leaves. Well, he leaves. That's it. Before that, he had had a few kind of spooky encounters with Stevens, to mm-hmm. which I think contributed to him asking the silly, dumb question instead of what was really well, on his mind. Yeah, because he he knows that Stevens will answer whatever question he asks, mm-hmm. but that's does it. he want to know the answer? Yeah. Like, does he need to know the answer that bad? Because the answer might be something that haunts mm-hmm. him forever. Yeah. Because uh, years ago on, I think it might have been his first night uh, to coming to the club, he had that same feeling of asking Stevens, what, what is this all about? And he's the last person in the club. Everyone else is gone. And he's about to ask. And he says from another room, he hears a slithering s- slump. Yep. Like, nope. <laughs> uh, like some heavy tentacle or something. Yeah. yeah. In another room. And he yeah, nopes right out. <laughs> um And this happens the same way where he's saying there's all of these, these things that don't exist in our world. But as we constant readers know, there are other worlds than this, Mm -hmm. which I know is why CM loved this story. (laughs) You got me. (laughs) Yes. And I did love this, this part, this final uh, bit where he's, he, it's he's working through his mind all the things he was wants to ask but as he's looking at Stevens he he has this feeling that if he asks the question the real question where are we right now he has this feeling that the large double doors will swing open onto a barren wasteland in another world and he will be forced out and never see uh home again yeah and that is amazing mm-hmm. see ya. <laughs> <laughs> you're no, so digging out over there i enjoy it so so much which i don't know if this kind of ties into my rating so i don't know if we want to get into ratings yet uh well, does anybody have any any final thoughts on the club itself before we we move on? I want to go so. to there. <laughs> yeah, I, I would one hundred percent want to hang out in this place. I want another book. That's what <laughs> I, that that's my final thought. Is my opinion on this book would improve one hundred to a thousand percent if King had followed it up with a proper novel all about the club. Yeah. Um, because uh, when he asks, are there other rooms upstairs? Stevens kind of smiles and says, oh yes, there are many rooms. <laughs> uh, in fact, some men have gone looking through them and have never returned. Um, and he's, uh, the main character says, uh, that there, I believe there are, are many exits, uh, entrances and exits up there. And he goes, oh, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, there are. Yeah. Okay, have a good night. And he leaves. And I, here's, here's the book I want. A young man gets brought into the club mm-hmm. for some reason. We discover a little more of the workings of why. The, we find out that it's because he's been chosen by either the other club members or some other force. Let's say maybe the club itself has chosen him. He sees something in him that he would bring something to this. He's an excellent storyteller. But he's also extremely curious. Mm-hmm. And so he comes in and he tells the best stories the club's the club had ever heard. But he also starts exploring. 
And so we have this give and take of him exploring and going further into the club and then being brought back out because the club still wants him for more stories. But eventually it goes too far. And that's the book I want to read, <laughs> but it doesn't exist in this level of the tower. <laughs> Which is why I love this story, because I'm okay with that feeling, that that need and that desire for more. It's but yeah, the book ends with uh with him leaving and saying, Well, that's that's my story. Per- and perhaps I'll tell you another one sometime soon. It's not too late. It could always happen. <laughs> it could. It could get a book. Come on, it Stephen could. King. Well, oh. if that book ever does come out, then my rating for this book will probably change. But until then. I don't know if that's what? how that works. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry about it. What is your rating? It was good. Uh, it was short, and I think that benefited it. But for not delivering, being a tease, essentially. <laughs> this book is a friggin' tease. Uh, I can't give it a five. I'll, I'll give it, uh, I want to give it a four, but I don't know if I can. You can do it. Uh, no, I'm going to give it a 3.5. Can we do that? Shh, I guess. 3. A half 5. shirt? Yeah, half <laughs> a right. shirt. The top half. It's cut off. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> it's a belly shirt. CM. I'm on pins and needles. I'm sorry. I have to refer to my notes because I don't want to lose. <laughs> oh, because oh. you don't remember the number five? <laughs> Wow. Awesome. <laughs> I loved this book because it's the first book in this collection of, st- of short stories in different seasons that I wanted to be in. I wanted to experience this with the characters and I wanted to explore the club and maybe walk through a door, even if that meant I couldn't come back. I was into that experience. It's that ultimate unanswered mystery and it has those elements i guess i just prefer science fiction fantasy horror mystery mm. novels so oh she's crying guys <laughs> <laughs> she's she's begun to full on weep i liked the wraparound story i mm. liked the breathing method part i thought it was all awesome and so i'm gonna have to give it five out of five blue chambray shirts there fantastic fair enough <laughs> all right um Wow, guys. So I came into today ready to give it a two. I went like I was I like I said, I, I was I was bored for mm. almost all of it. And it wasn't until the very end that I finally was invested enough to devour those last ten, but I sat through fifty real bored. But after the conversation we've had and like kind of clicking some of those things that didn't quite click for me when I was reading it, I realized how good the story is. Uh, It's still um, not what I was expecting or really kind of hoping for, but it was, it was good. And I would love to see more in this, in this world and, and some, some ties to it and what the potential of, of this story could turn into. Uh, So I'm going to, I'm going to give it a solid three, three out of five. All right. Three out of five. What? Blue chambray shirts. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Different seasons as a, as a whole. I'll just get mine out of the way because I just did my uh, mind for breathing method. Um, I honestly don't remember after we do this. I kind of forget the scores that I give things because uh, <laughs> that's who I am as a person. Uh, but the overall uh, mm-hmm. all like the fact that they were all they all had such a different feel and they all made me feel a different way uh, as I was reading them uh, just kept me. It, like locked in to this entire book. Um, and for that, I'm going to go ahead and give it a, a solid four out of five. I can't give it a five out of five because I only gave one story a five out of five. Mm. And that would seem weird if I gave the whole book a five <laughs> out of five after all that. But overall, ah, just these stories are so cool and they're so, they have such interesting characters, uh, such amazing standout characters that it makes it a solid four out of five for me. Fair. I'm right there with you. This is, I think I said in our uh, Shawshank episode, that this is the first King book I have read in probably a decade that has given me the same feeling that I had reading King in high school when I first discovered him, of just being blown away by not only the stories he's telling, but the way he writes is so 
good. He's such an amazing writer. Um, and I just, even when it was uncomfortable, like an apt pupil, even when it was maybe even a little boring, like in certain parts in the second half of the book, I was just, I couldn't put it down. And um, the breathing method, sorry, it's going to drag it down just a tiny bit because uh, I wanted more, uh, which isn't a bad thing. So I'm going to give the book as a whole different seasons a 4.5 out of 5. Thrown around de- decimal points. Just thrown around just halves. <laughs> Has like that's the so different season gets the bottom half of the shirt. <laughs> yeah, it, gets, <laughs> it, gets, it averages out. Yeah, they're gonna have to share. Yeah, I mentioned in my rating of the breathing method that I'm I prefer the more um, science fiction, fantasy, mystery, horror type writing that Stephen King does that anybody does. That's just my jams. I just like that. Mm. And this book obviously didn't have a lot of that in it which is probably why the breathing method was my favorite one because (laughs) it was glimpses into that and it's related to the dark tower i would argue Mm. and so overall um and like you said ben there were parts of the book that you just want to pull away from not because they're poorly written but because they're hard to get through because there is so much emotion and tragedy going on But for my personal preference, I would have to give the book overall a 4.5 blue chambray shirts. Whoa. Okay, stop the podcast. (laughs) Because that's the most insane thing I have ever heard in my life. What have I told you, Ben? You can't harp on her rating. It's her rating. No, no, it's fair. That's fair. Because... I would reread The Breathing Method. Mm-hmm. I do not need to reread the other stories. I like them. Okay. Oh, yeah. But That's they're fair. not one of his books. And I have many that I have read dozens of times. These aren't one of those okay. for me personally. So so the, your, your rating is perfectly fine. Here's why it's insane. <laughs> because you gave all four stories <laughs> within The Breathing or within different <laughs> seasons Five out of five. <laughs> and then the book as a whole, you gave a 4.5. What? That makes perfect it, sense. It, it, to me. I'm with CM. That I, makes 100% yeah, sense. Because, because she can read any of those stories without feeling compelled to read all four. Yeah. And I, I as I was reading each story, I was reading it, each as, story separate from right. the different seasons in its entirety. So the way I feel about each individual story ultimately, and I didn't realize this till like two seconds ago (laughs) is different than the way I feel about the book as a whole. Huh? Yeah. Fair enough. Makes sense. Fair enough. (laughs) (laughs) All right. That's it for this episode of dairy public radio. As always, thank you for listening. Please join us next time for a completely different book. Misery. We are so excited for this one because Ben is the only one who's read it. Episode one will cover all of part one and a little bit of part two up to chapter 12 or about 50% for you e-readers. And we hope that you'll read along or not read along and let us spoil the whole thing for you. That's okay. For Joshua Kahn and Benjamin Graham, I'm CM Alexander reminding you that there is no comfort without pain. Thus, we define salvation through suffering. Hey everyone, CM Alexander here. We have an interesting theory about Stevens to run by you. But first, I want to let you know that Audible is still offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership at audibletrial.com dairy. There you can browse an amazing selection of audio programs. Download a title for free and start listening. It's really simple. I've already started listening to Misery on Audible, and the voice actress is wonderful. Of course, you don't have to listen to Misery. Pick your favorite book. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash dairy. And now for our theory. Ben, Josh, and I try our best not to talk about any of the books we cover when the mics aren't rolling. But this one, we accidentally kept going, and Ben shared a theory that I think is too intriguing not to share with all of you. In the Dark Tower series, there are these elemental or elder beings— It is one who feeds on fear, and Dandelo is another, and he feeds on laughter. Perhaps Stevens is also one of these beings, 
and he feeds on that mysterious and wonderful feeling you get from sharing stories. It would certainly explain a lot about the club and how he operates it. We'd love to know what you think of this theory. I'm sure we're not the first to think of it. Let us know on our Facebook and Instagram at Dairy Public Radio or Twitter at Dairy Public. You can also send questions to our email, dairypublicradio at gmail.com. We'd also ask that you like and subscribe to our podcast because that's how other people find us. That's all for now, listeners. Goodbye.